Hi, I'm Alex Sudris, and welcome to tonight's Bold Method Live IFR. We're going to be talking about obstacle departure procedures, including a couple that we've flown out of Astoria and Eugene, Oregon. A lot of people think that obstacle departure procedures are only for mountainous areas and only for small aircraft, but that's not true. Uh, you'll find them anywhere, especially in the flatlands, because while a mountain is absolutely an obstacle, so is a concrete grain silo or a 2,000-foot radio tower, especially if you bump into them. They're all equally as hard. And it's not just something that you use into untowered or, or non-towered airports. You'll find them everywhere. Um, in fact, when we go out of uh, Santa Fe, we'll typically find the airlines will fly an obstacle departure procedure if they can't accept one of the graphicals. And then some of the graphical departure procedures that you'll see aren't actually SIDS. They're just a graphical ODP. So we'll go through all of that. We'll talk about it using two specific examples, uh, the Astoria departure and the Eugene departure. And we flew them both uh, about six months ago. So we'll actually go through the entire flight uh, from takeoff all the way up to once we turn in route. And you'll see how we fly that in our Cirrus SR-22. So uh, tonight, uh, Colin Cutler is technical director and running the chat because both Corey and Swain are out flying the line. So if you have any questions, Throw them out in chat. Colin will work them into the presentation. I know obstacle departure procedures are something the thing people don't fly a lot until you start working in, in real IMC and start doing a lot of cross countries. So if you're teaching or, or training and you just don't have a lot of in route or cross country IFR experience, you might have never flown any of these. Don't hes hesitate to ask us a question. Um, that's why it's live because we want it to be interactive. Okay, so we're going to start both of the examples we're using tonight are obstacle departure procedures, but we're going to start with a graphical one, which is a little bit more rare, but I think it, it helps you understand what's going on. They can be published two ways. They can be published graphically if they're complex, or they can just be published with a textual description. Graphical ones typically have an identifier and then can be filed in the flight plan, and then the textual ones can't. Uh, the interesting thing is, if, if you've got a textual departure procedure, you won't necessarily be cleared for it. But as an IFR pilot under Part 91, it is always your option. Under Part 135 or 121, it's oftentimes a requirement, unless you have some other approved procedure. Okay, so we'll start with the graphical one, and we're going to do that at, out of Astoria, Oregon. So let's take a look at floor flight. Uh, this is a great chance to see their new 3D view system. And you can see I've kind of got the airport lined up here. We're going to be departing on runway 26. And if you look at the area, uh, that big river there is a Columbia River. It flows up to Portland, Oregon, and it exits out into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this airport has tons of bad weather. Uh, we go down there to film IFR operations. If you have the ability to take a couple cross countries or to spend a week traveling while you work on your instrument rating or instrument proficiency, the West Coast, especially the Northwest Coast, is a great place to practice instrument flying. They usually don't have thunderstorms or convective activity, but they have lots of low weather. In fact, uh, if you look to the left of the 3D view, you can see Astoria is marked red right now and light rain and mist. That's why we love filming out there. They have an obstacle departure procedure because if you look, well, it's fairly open out towards the west to the ocean. Once you turn back around uh, towards land to the east, you've got 3,000 foot mountains that rise up pretty quickly. People go, well, that's not really that high, but when you need to outclimb them in a couple miles, 3,000 feet in a couple miles can take some real climb performance. And so the other thing you can see is over the, uh, it doesn't show up here on the diagram, you can kind of see the bridge. Uh, up at the very top of the of the uh, 3D image, but there's a large bridge there, a uh, big suspension bridge that goes across the river. You definitely wouldn't want to hit that. So when you're looking at this airport, you can see there's quite a bit of terrain just in the local area, and so that's why they've published a graphical obstacle departure procedure. As I said, we will be shooting off runway 26, and then in this flight, we're turning back to the south to head down to Tillamook, um, where they make all of the cheese. So let's take a look at the plate. This right here, uh, if you're getting ready for an airline interview and someone says, where are you going to find your obstacle departure procedures and takeoff minimums? The answer is the 10-9 plate on a Jepson chart. Uh, the 10-9 plate is the airport information and takeoff minimums. Sometimes there's several pages, but that's where you're going to find uh, a description of each of the runways, uh, general drawing of the airport, though sometimes they have it on a separate page, and then any takeoff minimums and departure procedures. So what you can see here take off all runways for both one, two, three, and four engine aircraft use the Astoria departure procedure. The other cool thing, uh, if you're getting, 
<coughs> excuse me, if you're getting ready for an airline interview, the alternate minimums are also listed on that 10-9 page. So you can find your takeoff obstacle departure procedures, your takeoff minimums, and your alternate minimums all on one page. Uh, that's a typical interview question, uh, and it's really easy if you know where to look, but if you've never seen a 10-9 page before, you can feel a little bit lost. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual Astoria departure procedure. I have the, uh, that's the FAA one, we'll use the Jepson one here. I've got this pulled up. So you can see a couple things. First of all, we have the actual diagram, kind of looks like a heart, and that's because there's different procedures depending on your departure runway. That's very typical of obstacle departure procedures. Uh, you'll also notice off to the side, they have takeoff obstacle notes. There are a ton of them. Okay, so what are these for? Well, these are what they call low close-in obstacles. They're under 200 feet within a mile of the departure end of the runway. The problem is to get yourself over the required climb gradient with these obstacles, they're so close, they would require an extreme climb gradient that many aircraft couldn't handle just to get a couple hundred feet off the ground. And typically, aircraft are already above these by the time they're departing that airport area. So they're not really an in-route or a departure climb problem, but they are really close in. And if you're lifting off right at the end of the runway, um, or if you've got really bad climb performance, they could be a hazard. So while they would normally drive an increased climb gradient, when the FAA can publish them as a low closed-in obstacle, it is simply your responsibility to see and avoid them. And so uh, what that really means is um, these, these obstacles can be up to a couple hundred feet within a mile of the airport. You want to make sure that you can lift off early enough or you have the visibility to see and avoid those obstacles until you're over the top of them. They list them all out. So people say, okay, so am I supposed to draw them on the map? Or There's no way that you're going to be able to identify where all of these are. It's, it's you know, not a bad idea to read and review them, but it's very hard to plot these. So in most aircraft, what that really means is you want to be over that altitude as soon as possible, um, preferably before you cross the departure end of the runway. Okay, um, then if you go down to the bottom of the Jeppesen plate, uh, you can see we have instructions for our initial climb. So depending on our runway, uh, if it's runway 8 or 14, and I'll highlight this as we walk through. So for runway 8, climb heading 080 to 1,000 feet, then a climbing left turn. Runway 14, climb heading 139 to 600 feet, then a climbing right turn. Runway 26, that's our departure. Climbing right turn. And runway 32, climbing left turn. Okay, keep in mind, for both 26 and 32, they're still assuming that we're going to do our standard IFR departure of climb to 400 feet above the departure end of the runway and then make that turn. So when people say, when do I start that turn in IFR, you're going to wait till you're 400 feet above DER, departure end of the runway, then you will begin the procedure turn. They just write climbing right or left turn immediately because they're assuming you're going to get to 400 feet and then make the turn. If they want you to go straight out or fly a heading for longer, then they'll publish that. And so if you saw for 8 and 14, that's why they're saying, okay, climb on a heading to 600 or to 1,000 feet. And if we go back to the Jepson chart, you can see essentially what they've got you on is runway heading on 8 and 14, either to 600 or 1,000 feet. So a little further out than that 400 feet DER. But if you're in, in an interview and they say, okay, climbing right turn, when would you start that? When you're 400 feet above the departure end of the runway. From there, we're going to move on to the routing. Uh, and if we look at that, that's in this section right down here. This is why they published it graphically. It can be a little bit confusing. Intercept the Astoria Radial 294 westbound. Aircraft northwestbound, intercept your Victor, Victor 112 and continue climb on course. All other aircraft climb to 2,000 feet or above then a left turn direct to the story of VOR and continue climbing on course. Uh, and then they publish a visual climb over airport. That is an option uh, so that if you do not meet an increased climb gradient, you can climb visually till you avoid obstacles. So if you take a look, this departure procedure requires takeoff minimums. For standard minimums, refer to the chart. I'm just gonna jump down to runway 26 so you can see it. Runway 26, 301 mile and a quarter or standard minimums, 
with a minimum climb gradient of 234 feet per nautical mile to 300 feet. Or alternatively, with standard minimums uh, and a normal 200 foot per nautical mile climb gradient, takeoff must occur no later than 1800 feet prior to the departure end of the runway. So what they've done is they've given us a couple options here. And I know this sounds complicated, but essentially one of the things that the FAA assumes is that many aircraft can lift off early on the runway. We don't need all of the runway to go. So oftentimes when there are close in, not close enough to be low close in obstacles, but still very close obstacles, the FAA says, okay, well, if you can lift off early enough on the runway, this isn't a problem. So in this case, they said, uh, you need a 234 foot per nautical mile climb gradient to 300 feet. That's not very high. Um, or you can use standard takeoff minimums and a normal 200 foot per mile, nautical mile climb gradient as long as you lift off no later than 1800 feet prior to the departure end. So then you would look at your takeoff distance, look at the runway length and figure if you can lift off prior to that. So there's clearly some really close obstacle in there. One advantage with a Jepson chart, if we go back to this chart, you'll see that with your ground speed, um, and they, they list each of the required climb gradients. They differ for each runway. You can see that they've given you your foot per uh, minute climb rates um, based off of not your indicated airspeed or your true airspeed, but your planned ground speed during climb. Um, a story is basically at sea level. So true airspeed and indicator are almost the same. You just need to factor in a headwind or a tailwind. Um, but now here you can use these as your foot per minute climb rates and make sure that you can clear that. Um, you can see for a Cirrus uh, departing that we need 234 feet per nautical mile for runway 26. Our takeoff climb speed is somewhere between 100 and 150 knots. So we need about a 600, conservatively, a 600 foot per minute climb at 150 knot ground speed. And at sea level, I could look at the performance charts and tell you we're gonna climb at 2,000 feet a minute. So I know that we can handle standard minimums departing this airport. And then with the graphical depiction, they also give you a good kind of example of how you're gonna fly this. So if you look at runway 26, they show you turning off, intercepting the radial, coming out, turning back around. Okay, so let's actually take a look at a map and fly that. Okay, so we're gonna use the same Jeppesen chart. We're just overlaying ourselves and we're gonna walk through what's going to happen. You could see on the right side, oops, sorry. Our flight plan right there. And since this is the Astoria 3, we can pull this up in our database, a GPS database, and allow the aircraft to navigate us through. So departure end of the runway, DER, or 400 feet above departure end is 420 feet. That's why it's got that fix. Uh, you'll see this flight plan cycle as we move through the Astoria 3. Uh, and then you can see our HSI down there. You'll see the needle cycle as we move through each of the legs. Okay, so let's start from liftoff. We're gonna fly straight out. Now remember, it said right turn, but we don't start that turn until 400 feet above the runway. So that's 420 feet. Once we reach that, we'll start a right turn to intercept the 294 radial. So we'll take an intercept heading. Once we get on that radial, we'll roll out to track. Something to think about. Well, the chart says 294, that does not necessarily mean your GPS is gonna say 294. And in fact, in this case, you'll see uh, our GPS says 293, a flight management system might say 293. And that's because 294 is the actual radial coming from the VOR station. Now the VOR is programmed with magnetic variation periodically. They call it the declination, uh, but it's not constantly updated. Even if it was, your database is constantly updating magnetic variation because it changes by the day. It moves slowly, but it's always changing. And so when your GPS is drawing a track or your flight management system is drawing a track, it's drawing a track between fixes. Those are lat long fixed. And so it's going to say, okay, here's my track by lat long and applying my current magnetic variation in my database, this is what I consider the magnetic course to be. So if you're flying one of these procedures with a GPS and you're like, you know, it's two degrees off what the chart says, 
that's normal. That's just that the GPS's magnetic variation doesn't necessarily match the radial from the VOR, or the variations changed uh, from when the chart was published to when your GPS databases are updated. Your GPS databases, as long as they're current, will almost always be more current than the chart. So, okay, so back to the iPad. So you can see that we're intercepting the 294 degree radio. We're gonna track that outbound. We're gonna take that outbound to 2,000 feet MSL. And you can see that instruction shows up right there in the chart. So we're basically just gonna hold that radial until we get to 2,000 feet. Once we get to 2,000 feet, we're gonna start a left turn direct to the Astoria VOR and then um, continue climbing on course. So essentially, go ahead and clear that. We're keeping our climb up to our cleared altitude and we're gonna fly our left turn around direct to Astoria. And we're gonna take it all the way to the VOR. The GPS is gonna give us turn anticipation. And that's consistent with what the FAA is looking for. If you're fast, you could overfly the boundaries. So turn anticipation will typically turn us just before we get to the VOR, but we'll, we'll hit the VOR and then continue our turn on course. And we're continuing to climb until we reach our cleared altitude. Okay, and from there, we're gonna continue on our course. It's a southeast course down to Tillamook. So let's take a look at this. We'll take a look at this in the airplane. Okay, so here we are. Uh, the weather was, Colin, what was it 200 feet? Uh, I think it was 300, about four, about 400, 400 feet. feet here. So just a little bit above uh, Finland. If any of you live in the Pacific Northwest, um, this is, I know everybody hates that weather. Um, and I always feel bad. We go down and we do a lot of filming out there and we go there just because that weather is awfully good. It's like, it's perfect low clouds, great instrument practice. You can get a lot of approaches close to minimums. Um, and again, there can be convective weather, but it's not nearly as common as it is in other parts of the United States. So if you're looking for a place to gain some instrument experience, the Pacific Coast, especially that Oregon coast, has fantastic airports. It's got some really cool towns. I love staying and working in Eugene, and I love staying in Astoria. Um, and, and it just is great practice. Almost all the time, the weather's bad. Unless we really need to get something, and then the weather's good. Okay, so we'll go back to the video. Um, I've already got my clearance, uh, and we've been cleared for the Astoria 3 departure. Uh, Colin, climbing to 6,000? To Climbing to 6,000 and then to Tillamook. So our route of flight is Astoria 3 dot Astoria direct Tillamook. So essentially the departure to the VOR and then over to Tillamook. Okay, so we've already got our clearance. It's non-towered airport, so I've made all my calls. Even though it's IFR, we're looking around for other aircraft. Uh, Coast Guard could be operating. Uh, there's a lot of helicopters in and out. The Bar Harbor pilots are flying aircraft or flying people onto and off of ships. So it looks bad, but there's a ton of aircraft operating around. They could be on a special VFR clearance. So as we line up on the runway, we're gonna make this a rolling takeoff. Uh, we did have the lights on, but they're LEDs and they don't show up very well on this. Um, we'll bring the power up. And you can see as we hit takeoff power, and roll down the runway, and we lift off well before 1,800 feet. Our liftoff speed today is uh, basically 77, so you'll see us take off right about there. And we're off. You'd see departure into the runway is about 20 feet, so that 400 DER makes sense. We're gonna wait till 420 feet to start our turn. So you can see in our flight plan, the GPS is actually navigating that. We're holding the runway heading to 420 feet. And I've also cycled on my uh, flight director here. Okay, that's 420 feet. Again, since we're using RNAV to navigate this, you can see it's already indicated my direct, next direct track. So now we're gonna start that left turn. And I'm gonna jump back to the map, or sorry, that right turn. I'm gonna jump back to the map so you can see where we are. This is where we are, right here. We're starting to make that turn to intercept. Okay, so I'll jump back to where we were there. It 
is we make that right turn. We actually enter the clouds. So clouds are probably about 500 feet. You really can't tell that we're turning outside of the turn coordinator and the rate of turn indicator. And we're just turning for an intercept here. We're looking for 2,000 feet. That's when we can turn back to the VOR. And we're climbing pretty fast. It's turbocharged and we're down low, so we have a good climb rate. You can see our needle's closing in. So we're going to lead that turn to intercept the 294. OK, now we're established on the 294 radial. So if we take a look at that, go back to the map again, this is where we are, right here. So our next track is going to fly this, it'd be to fly this radial outbound until we're at or above 2,000 feet. They give us a little bit of latitude here, at or above. And part of that is because if you're climbing much faster, let's say you're in a turbine aircraft, you're climbing at three or 4,000 feet a minute, you could still be so close to the VOR that there really is no practical way to get the airplane turned around and going back towards Astoria. So as a pilot, you do have to consider that. For most light aircraft, we've got lots of room because it takes us a while to get to 2,000 feet. But if you're flying a high-performance twin or if you're flying a jet-powered aircraft, you could easily cross that 2,000 feet you know, before you're even established outbound of the 294. And if you make that immediate turnaround, you might be just chasing the VOR. So they give you a little latitude. If you need to go out for a little bit so that you can make that turn, the FAA gives you that room. You need to make the turn at or above 2,000 feet. Okay, so let's go back to the video as we cross 2,000 feet. So, or as we um, are established on that radial, um, which is right here. And you can see we're, we're just tracking straight out. We're holding our cruise climb speed of 120 knots. I have that set up on the flight director. And we're waiting for 2,000. We can see we're closing in now. You'll see the GPS will prompt us next rec tack 82. And so now we'll start our turn. And if we look at the map again, oh, that turn is going to be a left turn around and then back to the VOR and then on course. So, so we're rolling into a left turn. One of the advantages of flying this with RNAV in a flight plan, either using a, like a Garmin or an FMS, is that it's automatically cycling my CDI for us. We're continuing our climb to 6,000 feet. And you can see about 25, 2,600 feet, we're starting to pop out of the tops. And essentially, we're going to keep this turn coming until we line up and can go direct to Astoria. And you can see our flight plan's already indicating direct Astoria. The great thing about a GPS uh, in this case is it's actually figuring out our radius of turn and it's going to roll us out smoothly so that we're direct to Astoria. If you're using green needles or a VOR, you'd be constantly twisting the VOR as you're trying to adjust what your direct radial is going to be because you don't know that exactly. And you can see on our HSI, now we're rolling out direct. And we'll continue that all the way in. I'll fast forward this a little bit. And the GPS will give us turn anticipation. So once it does that, We'll continue our turn on course, and we'll end up flying out towards Tillamook. And we reach our cruise altitude not too far, far after. OK, so taking a look back at the map, one of the things to think about is a lot of this course depends on your airplane. Um, this turn point at 400 DER. That's going to be kind of standard for everybody. Then once you start to turn in, you're going to fly this track. All aircraft will be on the same track. 
But once you start this turn direct, that's gonna depend on your aircraft speed, how fast you're flying. If you're flying slow, you could find that you make this turn in really early. Uh, if you're flying something jet powered, that turn can be much wider. And so that part of the, that part of the procedure Essentially, people go, okay, well, what radial is this? It's just direct. You know, if you're flying something fast, you might be down here by the time you complete that turn. The key is that you go direct. Okay, so we have a question. All right, so Alex has a good question here, and that is, do I have to fly an ODP if the airport has one? That depends. Um, under Part 91, you don't. Uh, part 91, they are entirely optional. In fact, people say, you know, do I... Can I depart an airport without an instrument um, approach under Part 91? Absolutely. Can I depart an airport where they haven't sur surveyed it for departure under Part 91? IFR. Absolutely. Can I do a zero zero takeoff under Part 91? Absolutely. You just really wouldn't want to do that. Uh, believe it or not, Part 91 operations are given a ton of latitude. Essentially, we never have to fly an obstacle departure procedure, and we can always refuse a standard instrument departure. You could just go, and, and as long as you're uh, maintaining terrain clearance, the FAA is happy. But the reality is it's extremely hard to do. Um, so if there is an ODP published, uh, and there is not an alternative published departure procedure, if there is a SID or a graphical ODP or a textual ODP, any of those three, will assure, assure you terrain clearance. Um, but if there is one published, you really should fly it. And keep in mind, those takeoff minimums are there in case something goes wrong, uh, not just if everything goes right. People go, well, you know, I feel really comfortable with this. I don't mind making a takeoff in a quarter mile visibility. In a single engine airplane that's piston powered, a lot can go wrong right after takeoff. And in a quarter mile visibility, you really can't see anything anymore. So making a safe emergency landing can be impossible. So again, one of the things I tell people, you don't need to follow takeoff minimums under Part 91. You don't need to follow ODPs under Part 91. The only exception is if you accept a SID or a published departure procedure like the Astoria 3 that has published minimums. Those are part of the procedure. Accepting the procedure means that you need to fly the minimums, but you can always refuse the procedure. Under Part uh, 121 or Part 125 or Part 135, in those cases, Yes, then you need to fly them unless you're flying an alternate approved procedure. So that's how that goes. Okay, next question. Okay, Paul's got a really good question. So we use Jeppesen charts here, but he wants to know, what happens if you're not using Jeppesen charts? Does the FAA have similar charts? The FAA does. And, and uh, I prefer Jeppesen charts. Um, the airlines use them for a variety of reasons. Not only are they standardized across countries, but airlines can put in their special pages and their special procedures and their minimums uh, if the FAA is approved minimums. But the FAA charts have the same information. Um, and if you have a four flight sub subscription, um, those are essentially no added costs. So let me pull one of those up. So I showed you the Astoria, and I'm gonna clear, this is the, and that's the Jeppesen one. This is the FAA one. Uh, they've divided it between two pages. There's that little next arrow to the right. If you take a look, it shows the same depiction. They draw it a little bit differently, but it is the same depiction. Um, they have the takeoff minimums published right below, and then the same departure route description. If you go to the next page, the FAA has listed all of the takeoff obstacle notes on a separate page. So that's what they've done there. Um, when you look at the Jepson charts, sometimes, this one isn't, but sometimes they'll be geo-referenced. You'll see that because there's a blue border you'll see around a section of the chart. It looks kind of like, um, something like this. You'll see it kind of bordering this up. Uh, and that means you can track your aircraft's position on there. Uh, you typically won't see those uh, with obstacle departure procedures and that you can't track your position on FAA charts. They're not geo-referenced right now, though they could change. Um, but the FAA charts have the exact same amount of information. Okay, um, so that is a graphical obstacle departure procedure. It's not a SID, it's not for traffic management, it's just for terrain avoidance. And it's something that people don't see a lot of. Uh, there's not a ton of them out there, but it makes them very easy to, file, uh, to fly and to file because they have a name. And since they have a name, 
they could be in your, in your GPS or FMS database. So that's what you saw there. It'll, it'll navigate you through the procedure. But what happens if you're flying a textual obstacle departure procedure? It's kind of a mouthful. Um, let's take a look at Eugene. Okay, so Eugene has a standard departure that they're gonna assign to everybody. It's the Eugene 1. Um, and if you look at it, it basically just shoots you straight off the runway. And um, from there, the FAA is going, or the ATC will give you radar vectors. However, the takeoff climb gradient is a little bit steep. Um, essentially, it requires a climb gradient of 335 feet per nautical mile off of runway 16 left. So let me show you that. <clears throat> and off of three, four left and right, 380 feet per nautical mile to 4,400. 4, for a piston powered airplane, this actually may be a difficult departure procedure to fly. Uh, you're gonna need somewhere around at 100 knot ground speed, 600 knots or 600 feet per minute uh, to 650 um, climb, or climb rate to meet this, this obstacle to, or to meet this departure procedures requirements. And you might not have that, especially if you're flying uh, an older aircraft, 150 horsepower, 172, that may not be practical. So if we take a look at the airport's 10-9 page or the takeoff minimums in the FAA page, you'll see that they publish a separate obstacle departure procedure. And if we look at this obstacle departure procedure, First of all, um, they do not post any higher takeoff minimums. Uh, they don't require any higher climb gradient here. And if you read it, it says for runway 16 left, I'll highlight it as I go, climb heading of 164 to 1200 feet, then climbing right turn. Runway 16 right, climb heading 164 to 1200, then climbing right turn. 34 left, climb heading 344 to 1200, then climbing left turn. And 34 right, climb heading 344, or sorry, um, all aircraft climb direct Eugene VOR, then climb and hold in Eugene VOR holding pattern, hold north, right turns 180 degrees inbound to cross the Eugene VOR at or above the MEA before proceeding on course. So that's where this gets a little bit confusing. You're essentially going to fly, let's say we're departing 34 right, okay? You're going to climb on a heading of 344, which is basically runway heading, okay? to 1,200 feet MSL, then continue the climb in a left turn. From there, you're gonna climb direct to the Eugene VOR, enter a holding pattern, hold north, right turns 180 degrees inbound to cross the Eugene VOR at or above the MEA before proceeding on course. So let's take a look at a map and see what this would look like. Okay, unfortunately, there's no drawing for this. This is something that we're gonna to have to draw out ourselves. We're gonna depart, if we're departing, um, let's see, this one, yeah, one six. One six right. Are we one six on this? Okay, so on one six, we'll fly the heading out until we reach, let's see, let me pull up the altitude for that. One six right. Climb heading 164 to 1200, then a right turn. So, so we'll fly on heading 164 until we reach 1200 feet, then a right turn direct to the VOR. We'll cross the VOR and enter a holding pattern. So the holding pattern's on the 180 degree radial, right hand turns, we're holding north. So if you draw that, it'll be something like this, fly in, right turns, and around. So the entry here looks like a parallel entry, and that's what we'll do. Track outbound, execute the parallel, cross the VOR. From here, we'll continue holding in the pattern until we cross the required altitude. So if you look at the chart again, we're gonna hold in the pattern to cross the Eugene VOR at or above the MEA before proceeding on course. So in this example, our flight is to Salem, Oregon, not too far to the north, and our MEA was 4,000 feet. So essentially, we're gonna sit in that holding pattern until we climb above 4,000 feet on our way to our assigned altitude. 
And then once we get above that, we can either ask ATC for direct or we'll continue the pattern until you hit the VOR again and then turn yourself on course. If you, if you don't have the ability to ask for direct from ATC, that's what they're gonna expect. You're gonna continue your turns until you're above 4,000 feet. You'll finish the turn you're in. Once you hit the VOR, you'll turn yourself out on course. Okay, so let's fly this one. Since we can't load this in the database, uh, we can still use RNAV, uh, and we don't have it drawn down here, but typically I'll have the VOR up as a bearing pointer, um, but we've got RNAV because you can substitute RNAV for a VOR. You can use RNAV to track to or from a VOR and determine distance. So you could still use magenta needles, um, and I typically do because there are fewer errors associated with RNAV. You don't end up with a cone of confusion. Uh, you don't end up with um, just kind of the, the scalloping that you'll get sometimes off of a VOR. So I prefer RNAV, but we'll typically have the bearing pointer tuned to the VOR and underneath it. So I do have raw VOR data too. Okay, so this is a tower controlled airport. Uh, we're waiting for a clearance. And let's get ourselves moving. A taxi on, you can clearly see the lights here. Uh, this is an airport that has lots of bad weather, so we have kind of a Christmas tree runway. We'll line up on one six right and power up, and we're ready for takeoff. See the runway elevation is about 380 feet. Um, So again, really close to sea level. And we've got about, I think, a 200 foot overcast layer today. Okay. So I'm holding 164 to 1,200 feet. I'm just gonna climb straight out, waiting for 1,200 uh, 1, feet MSL here. Okay, and here's 1,200 feet. At this point, I'm gonna start my right turn direct to the VOR. Now, keep in mind, this is not a procedure that I can load from the, D the GPS database. It's not a, a uh, chartered departure procedure, so I have to fly this manually. So what I'm gonna do is hit direct. I'll start my right turn so that it doesn't make a mistake and, and start to try to turn me in the wrong direction, but then I'll hit direct to Eugene, and it'll automatically cycle for me. And so, from here, you can see I'm rolling into the turn. Again, you really can't tell, uh, but you can see it on my turn indicator and my rate of turn indicator. And again, the GPS... Wet Say again? It's wet too. It was wet. Yeah, it's always wet there. Okay, there are the tops. And I'm continuing that turn all the way around. Until I reach direct. And again, one of the advantages, if I start the turn to the right and then hit direct, the GPS can figure out kind of the ideal uh, rate of turn. It does a very good job of, of lining me right up. If you're using the VOR, you're gonna be constantly recentering the needle throughout the turn. Okay, so now I'm direct in. You can see at the top, I'm about 1.3 miles away. I'm continuing my climb. I need to hold until I'm above 4,000 feet. And I've been assigned 4,000 feet at the, I've been assigned the MEA for our route. So that's why I have that selected. Okay, and I can tell right here, you can see that we're not going to make it to 4,000 feet before we cross uh, the VOR. So in this case, I'm gonna end up flying my entry. So remember, it's 180 degree, um, or it's a 300 and, yeah, 360 degree radial um, right-hand turns. So I'm gonna select that, turn for my parallel, start my time, 
And I'll show you that. I'm going to cycle back over to the chart. You can see that we would be right there. So I'm going through that part of the entry. I'm going to fly that. And in this airplane, I can actually use the GPS to fly my holding pattern. So I've entered the holding pattern in there. Now I'll start my procedure, my uh, parallel turn to intercept. Now I headed back inbound. And you can see when we did that, as we were flying, I'm going to rewind just a little bit. As we were flying through the parallel entry, you can see that's where he hit 4,000 feet. So I still need to continue this entry. And I still need to cross the VOR one more time. So you can see I, I continue the parallel entry and I continue to cross the VOR. And from here, I'll turn outbound on course. A couple advantages. Um, what I did in this case, because I had the holding pattern programmed, You'll notice at the bottom, during the holding pattern, we're in suspend. Once I come through 4,000 feet, I take the GPS out of suspend. That way, it will automatically cycle on to my next waypoint once I complete my turn and holding. So you'll see that as I complete, I intercept, complete my turn and holding, and you'll notice now my GPS automatically cycles and I can continue up to Salem. The toughest thing about uh, these procedures is typically that you don't have a chart, so it can really help to draw them out. Uh, that's one of the things that I'll do uh, just on an in route, uh, in an in route chart on for flight or on the airport diagram or just on a scratch pad. That way I know exactly where I want to go and how I want to fly it. Um, and even though it's a VOR based procedure, um, you can always use RNAV to substitute for VOR navigation. And so um, typically I'll monitor the VOR underneath, uh, but I'm going to use RNAV for this departure because it kind of gets rid of those VOR errors. The key thing is it's my responsibility to tell the system when to cycle on to the next point. Okay, looks like we've got a question. Okay, we've got a good one from Avery uh, on the uh, Eugene departure we just flew. Uh, and the question is, why do we have to finish the turn and hold before we can turn on course? That's a great question, and it's just because that's where ATC expects you to begin your turn from. When you, once you start a holding pattern, the entry point and the exit from the pattern is a holding fix. So you would never just turn away from a holding pattern in the middle of an outbound or inbound leg. You would always wait until you cross the fix again. Each turn and holding, you kind of have to finish the leg. That being said, especially somewhere like Eugene where there's uh, radar, if you want to make your direct right away, just ask them and they'll give it to you. Uh, so typically that's not an issue. But if you're not in radar contact or if ATC is busy and you don't have the time to ask them for direct, they expect you to finish that turn before you proceed on course. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, we had another question. I don't have time to uh, pop it up on the screen, but it's a really good follow-up one. And it's from Mark, and he says, uh, what happens if you're, uh, you departed, you're making the right turn back to the VOR at Eugene? What happens if you hit 4,000 feet before you get to the VOR? Do you need to do that holding entry? Nope, you don't. And that's, even in um, a piston, if you're in a, a twin or a turbocharged single, especially if you're climbing at VY, there's a chance you're going to get to 4,000 before you get back to the VOR. And if you do, then you can continue on course. That holding pattern is it's there to allow an aircraft to climb up above obstacles before proceeding on the MEA. And if you go back to the definition, it doesn't say climb and hold to 4,000. It says climb and hold to the MEA for your route of flight. And so it, that all depends on which direction you're going, where the MEA is. You'll stay in that holding pattern until you exceed your MEA. Um, but again, it, if, you, if you reach the MEA before you hit the VOR, once you cross the VOR, you can just continue on course. Okay, next question. Okay, next up, and this one actually goes back to Astoria. Uh, so Cobb wants to know, uh, he says, the ODP states a heading 
of 080. This could really be any runway heading, but he says 080. What happens if you have a big crosswind on takeoff? Do you fly runway heading or should you fly a course of 080? Or in our case, we took off runway 26, so a course of 260 instead of the heading. Good question. Uh, in IFR, you don't have to think that much about it, luckily. Um, and this can get really confusing in VFR because oftentimes when we say runway heading, we really mean runway center line. In the IFR world, when they say heading, they mean heading. They want you to fly that specific heading. They have already cleared the area, figuring that there could be some sort of crosswind. They're assuming that you're in the clouds and that you can't tell what your wind drift is. Now, I know today everybody's kind of used to the fact that we have um, ground track indicators that can tell us specifically what our ground track is, but keep in mind, these procedures could be flown by an airplane. The Astoria departure could be flown by an airplane with nothing but a VOR, and you would have no idea if you were drifting or not uh, when you're in the air. So, especially until you're high enough to get the VOR radio. So the, the reality is in IFR, when they say a heading, they mean that. They'll say, fly this heading, and you hold that heading until you're established. And they've already kind of factored in the fact that the wind could blow you around. If they want you to track a course on a traditional NAVAID-based system, uh, they'll give you a radial, or they'll say direct to. Uh, but really, in the IFR world, you can, you can just follow the words they say. VFR, it's actually a little bit different. I'm just going to mention that because oftentimes, in a strong crosswind, we'll hear runway heading, uh, when we're departing VFR, and I'll typically say, hey, do you guys want me to maintain runway centerline? And I know that kind of sounds picky. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. So I'll clear that up there. But in the IFR world, when they assign you a heading, you fly the heading. Okay, that's all the time we got for tonight. I hope you liked the flights. Let us know what you thought about those. We've got quite a bit of flying uh, logged out on the West Coast, and I'd like to do more of those if it works for you. So let us know. Uh, Tell us what you think about it. A couple housekeeping items. In two weeks, uh, we will be holding the next IFR Live, but we're moving it to Wednesday. Uh, on Tuesday, we're going to be doing some work with the Air Force. So um, it'll be Wednesday, two weeks from now. And then tomorrow night is our pro pilot night. We're going to talk about mental math for pilots. Um, some of the interview questions that you'll get at a regional or a main airline. Uh, a lot of 60 to 1 rule stuff. So if you want to brush up on your mental math and kind of rules of thumb, that'll be tomorrow night. And um, links are at boldmethod.com live. We hope to see you in a couple weeks. Good night.